Have you ever noticed that when we buy something in a shop, the shopkeeper may scan the barcode of the product using a device with a light in it? What is that? That's a laser. You are watching this video on the internet right now, which helps in the transfer of information over large distances that may involve optic fiber cables with lasers. You see, lasers are everywhere. Whether we talk about laser printers, laser scanners, whether we talk about data storage using CDs, DVDs, Blu-rays, whether we talk about industrial applications of cutting and welding of materials, whether we talk about uh, medical technologies like LASIK surgery or various kinds of skin treatments, whether we talk about military applications of guidance and weapon systems, whether we talk about surveillance, whether we talk about uh, communications, research and development, lasers are very important in modern technology. However, the physics behind lasers is very simple. It is based on a very simple and unique uh, atomic transition known as stimulated emission, which was suggested by Albert Einstein in 1917. But it took almost 30 years after that for somebody to figure out everything and build an actual laser. So in today's video, we are going to talk about the physics behind lasers. We're going to discuss a three level laser system. And then we're going to talk about the Einstein coefficients and Einstein's approach to explaining the plant's black body radiation spectrum using the concept of stimulated emission. So let's begin. So here we have various kinds of atomic transitions involving emission or absorption of radiation. You see, in my previous lectures, we talked about the structure of the atom. We saw that the atom has discrete energy levels and the atom can make transitions from one energy level to another energy level uh, which is associated with either an absorption or emission of a photon of sufficient frequency. So we saw that these kinds of discrete energy levels are associated with discrete transitions involving emission or absorption of photons. Now this leads to mainly two kinds of transitions. On one hand, if we have an atom which is in the ground state, then it is capable of absorbing a suitable radiation and getting excited to a higher excited state. This is known as simply absorption or stimulated absorption in which an atom in a lower state absorbs an incident radiation of sufficient energy and gets excited to a higher state. Now, the second case is spontaneous emission. When What happens when the atom is in the higher state or in the excited state? It can automatically or spontaneously come down to its ground state with the release of an incident photon and the photon has energy which is equal to the difference in the energies between the excited and the ground state. This is known as spontaneous emission because it happens spontaneously. It usually takes a time of around 10 to the power minus 8 to 10 to the power minus 12 seconds for a spontaneous emission to take place. Now it was Einstein in 1917 who suggested for the very first time that apart from these two transitions, there is a third transition which is also possible and that is known as stimulated emission. So if you have an atom in an excited state, then it can be stimulated by an external photon to cause a transition or a de-excitation to a ground state, releasing another photon in that process. This is known as stimulated emission. Stimulated emission is caused by an external photon of sufficient frequency. It is the external photon that triggers that uh, de-excitation process of the higher excited state of the electron to the lower excited state of the electron. In this process, a suitable frequency of light is emitted, which is in phase with the incident photon. So this process basically takes one photon but emits two photons which are in phase and which have the same frequency. So it is this stimulated emission which lies at the basic working mechanism of laser. So first of all, what is a laser? Let's look at the full form of the laser. You see, when we talk about laser, it is actually an acronym which stands for light amplification 
by stimulated emission of radiation. Now, the name of the laser itself contains the concept of stimulated emission and how amplification of light happens via the stimulated emission of radiation. Now to understand what a laser is, let's try to understand some of its properties. You see, how is laser different from ordinary light? When we talk about ordinary light, it may contain a large number of wavelengths, different wavelengths, which are out of phase with each other. That's ordinary light for you. Now you may have monochromatic light. The meaning of a monochromatic light is that it contains the same wavelengths, but they may be out of phase with each other. And then you can have monochromatic coherent light, which contains the same wavelength, all waves being in phase with each other. So this third category of light is what the laser consists of. So first of all, a laser consists of monochromatic radiation or monochromatic light that means it contains one wavelength and all the waves of the beam of the laser are in phase so we call it coherent so it's a coherent monochromatic light now because the laser is monochromatic and coherent so what we end up getting is two more properties. One is that, first of all, it is an intense beam. You see, whenever you have waves which are in phase, you end up getting constructive interference of all the waves that leads to a very intense beam. And also a beam that does not diverge or it diverges very less or you can say does not diverge. What does this mean? You see, when we talk about normal light, like let's suppose we take a torch light, it diverges along its path, so it spreads out. However, when we talk about a laser, it doesn't really spread that much compared to normal radiation. And that's why lasers can travel vast distances without experiencing much divergence in its beam. So these properties constitute the uh, characteristics of how a laser is different from ordinary light. Now the question is how can we create a laser light having these properties using the concept of stimulated emission. For that, we have to understand how atomic transitions happen between different energy levels. So here we have three distinct energy levels. So let me specify which one represents what. So the lower energy level is the ground state. The upper energy level is the excited state. This Excited state is usually short-lived, so I'm going to call it a short-lived excited state. And the state in the middle is a metastable state. What is the difference between an ordinary excited state and a metastable state is that an excited state is very short-lived while a metastable state is uh, long-lived or has a long lifespan compared to the ordinary excited state. Now ordinary excited state usually uh, undergoes de-excitation in a time interval of around 10 to the power minus 8 to 10 to the power minus 12 seconds while metastable state can survive for longer durations time periods of around uh, 10 to minus 3 seconds or something comparable to that. So how does that make a difference? So let us try to understand uh, what happens. So whenever we have first of all uh, absorption at let's suppose time t is equal to 0 then because of an external radiation let's suppose an atom goes from a lower excited state to a higher excited so state. So let's suppose the atom goes from the ground state to the short-lived excited state uh, when it absorbs some sort of an incident radiation. Now what happens is that because the ordinary excited state is very short-lived, usually 
it gets de-excited to the metastable state in a time span of around 10 to the power minus 8 seconds. So this may be a spontaneous emission or this may be some kind of a non-radiative emission. I'm, com I'm going to come to that in a moment. Now what's going to happen is that the atom is going to now be in this particular uh, metastable state for a longer duration. This is where the uh, lasing transition happens. This is where when if we introduce a light of sufficient or suitable frequency, then this transition causes a stimulated emission where a photon is emitted which is in phase with the incident photon and this constitutes the laser light. Now at this point you might have a few questions in mind. First of all, why do we need a three level system? Why can't we have just a two level system, right? We were talking about absorption and spontaneous emission and stimulated emission for just two levels, right? Ground state and excited state. But why are we talking about a three level system? You see, the thing is that whenever we have an incident photon, which is incident on an atom, if the photon has sufficient energy, then the atom can jump to an excited state, number one. But the atom can also get de-excited to a ground state if an excited state already exists. So an incident photon is capable of inducing both absorption and stimulated emission. Now usually, if you have an assembly of atoms, if you have a large number of atoms, then at normal temperatures, majority of the atoms are going to be in its ground state. Now, if I introduce an incident radiation of sufficient frequency or sufficient energy, then a large number of those atoms will jump from the ground state to the excited state. Now, what happens? Now, what happens is that the excited atoms will immediately experience spontaneous emission and come back to its ground state. Because of this reason, what happens is that usually it is the ground state which is populated, number one. And number two, uh, because a spontaneous emission happens in such a small time period, therefore, there isn't much time for an incident photon to come and cause stimulated emission in the process. So usually, the rate at which the spontaneous uh, emission happens is far larger compared to the rate at which stimulated emission happens. Now, when we talk about a laser, we are interested in laser amplification or light amplification. So the key concept of a laser is that we need to have a large number of atoms in the excited state as compared to the ground state, right? If we have an equal number of atoms in the excited state, an equal number of atoms in a ground state, then an incident photon will cause stimulated emission, but it will also cause uh, absorption. So there is stimulated emission and absorption. So it kind of balances out. We do not end up getting uh, light amplification. For light amplification to be there, we need stimulated emission to dominate over the spontaneous emission and the absorption processes. And because in a two level system, this doesn't usually happen because it is an incident photon causing both the absorption and the stimulated emission, we never really get a situation usually where stimulated emission dominates over the absorption or the spontaneous emission. That is why the light amplification is not possible in that kind of a two level system. However, when we introduce a three level system, then we end up getting a situation where a metastable state exists where the atoms can come and exist for a longer duration which then finally comes down to the ground state via stimulated emission processes. We can create a scenario in which a large number of atoms exist in the metastable state as compared to the ground state. So such kind of a system is known as a three level laser system. Now this process in which we try to increase the number of photons in the higher state as opposed to the ground state is known as population inversion. In the process of population inversion, we are essentially interested in uh, take having a large number of atoms in the state above the ground state so that we end up getting more stimulated emission thereby causing uh, the lacing transitions or the lacing photons to be emitted. Now there are different kinds of method of population inversion. One of them is called optical pumping. 
In optical pumping, we essentially introduce some sort of a suitable radiation into the material which causes the transitions from ground state to the short-lived excited state to take place. Then that is followed by an immediate non-radiative transition to the metastable state where a large number of atoms exist. And then if you introduce a photon of sufficient frequency which is different from this photon, you end up getting stimulated emission to happen which constitutes the laser light. Now let us discuss this process in a little bit more detail but let me first draw a couple of diagrams. So here is a three stage laser where we will discuss each of these uh, steps one by one. So initially we have some sort of a material which is exposed to some incident radiation which then makes a transition from a lower state to a higher state. So to achieve this kind of a population inversion, we use optical pumping initially. So this is the first step of optical pumping. To excite a bunch of atoms in the ground state to the higher excited state. So the moment the atoms in the ground state absorb some kind of an incident light and jump from the ground state to the higher excited state, it instantaneously, because the higher excited state is short lived, it instantaneously uh, transitions to the metastable state. Now this transition to the metastable state from the short lived higher excited state uh, is usually non radiative. Now what is this non radiative uh, transition? So let's say that this is point number two and I'm going to call this as uh, point number two non radiative transitions. Which simply means that whenever an atom uh, gets excited or de-excited, it is not usually happening all the time because of electromagnetic radiation. There are other processes via which an atom can be excited or de-excited. For example, uh, in this situation where an atom went from a ground state to a higher excited state, it did so because of an incident radiation of sufficient energy. But in normal uh, situations, if light is not present, then because of the thermal agitation of the atoms in a given uh, 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 gas or a solid, uh, the kinetic energy can also cause an uh, atom to get excited to a higher energy level. All right. Similarly, a higher excited state atom can also go to a lower excited state by losing energy in the process of uh, internal conversion. So for example, non-radiative transitions, for example, vibrational relaxation or creation of phonons in the crystal lattice of the solid. So there are other non-radiative mechanisms through which an atom can get uh, de-excited to a lower energy level. So this is what usually happens in a three-level system that once via optical pumping, uh, the number of atoms are uh, pushed to a higher energy state, they immediately undergo non radiative transitions and come to a metastable state. Now because the metastable state is having a long lifespan, now suddenly we have a large number of atoms in the metastable state, thereby achieving the population inversion that I was talking about. Now, if we introduce an incident photon whose frequency is different from this photon, okay, so this photon has a frequency of let's suppose nu dash. And now if we introduce a photon of let's suppose uh, frequency nu, then uh, all these atoms in the excited state will make a transition from the metastable state to the ground state and in that process you end up getting a large number of same frequency waves in phase. So you have the incident photon 
and then you have multiple emitted photons in phase that constitute what is known as the lacing transition. So this is known as the lacing transition. So by this method, we are able to achieve a population inversion and we are able to achieve a situation in which we get stimulated emission which dominates over other processes, thereby creating a large number of photons of same frequency in phase that can be released in the form of a laser beam. So the construction of the laser may look something like this, where the material in the laser experiences this kind of an optical pumping via flash tube or something similar. And then the spontaneous emission from the metastable state to the ground state then starts creating stimulated emissions further and these photons go back and forth between the partially silvered mirrors and when the number of photons is sufficient enough it penetrates through the mirror and released like a laser beam that we are familiar with. Now the three stage uh, laser is not the only uh, uh, method, there are other kinds of laser mechanisms. We have the three stage laser, we have the four stage laser. So the four stage laser involves four different states where one of the transitions is associated with the stimulated emission and the other transitions may be associated with some sort of a non-radiative or other kind of a phenomena. The simple process of the stimulated emission performed in a very unique manner ends up creating a highly coherent, highly intense, non-diverging beam that has a large scale technological implications in today's world. So therefore laser is very, very important. And the physics of the laser, however, is quite simple and interesting and arises from uh, the way uh, transitions happen due to uh, the atomic structure that we have been discussing in my previous lectures. Now let us look at um, Einstein's suggestion and what he had to say about this stimulated emission. In 1917, Albert Einstein suggested the stimulated emission between two energy levels. And he used this idea to explain uh, the Planck's distribution law for the black body spectrum. Now, if you remember, we have talked about black body spectrum a couple of lectures back where we discussed this in detail that materials usually have this kind of a radiant energy density or black body radiation that has a certain kind of a distribution which was finally given an explanation of by Max Planck uh, via his Planck energy distribution function. Now, we can use Einstein's approach to come up with a similar kind of a distribution function for the energy density of uh, light emitted by materials. So for that, we are going to assume two different levels. So here we have a ground state. Let's suppose I'm going to call this as E0 and or E1, let's suppose ground state E1, okay, n is equal to 1. And then we have the excited state here. I'm going to call this as E2. Okay, state n is equal to 2. So transitions between these two energy levels is possible via some kind of a suitable frequency nu such that h nu is equal to the energy level difference. And we can have three distinct mechanisms by which this can happen. So let us first look at the absorption of a photon. Now, when we talk about absorption of a photon, then we are basically interested in, let's suppose some sort of an incident radiation. Let me draw this, extend this a little bit further to complete the diagram. So we can have some kind of an incident photon, which is absorbed by the atoms. Let's suppose the incident photon has energy H nu. And because of this, the atom makes a transition from E1 to E2. Now I'm interested in the rate of this absorption. All right. So how can I calculate the rate of this particular absorption? Now, first of all, if we look at a material in, let's suppose, thermal equilibrium, then the material is emitting radiation. It is also absorbing radiation, but it is emitting and absorbing radiation in such a manner 
that uh, its temperature is a constant of time so it's in thermal equilibrium so let us suppose that the uh, thermal energy radiation density basically is given by u okay so i'm going to say that i have uh, energy density corresponding to the radiation uh, which is basically emitted by any kind of a material for a given frequency range uh, nu is given by u nu all right so it will depend on that particular radiation density right greater the radiation density experienced by the material greater will be the absorption of the radiation for that particular frequency so if i am interested in figuring out what is the rate of this transition so if i'm interested in the rate of the transition from let's suppose one to two then of course the rate of transition will depend upon the energy density corresponding to that particular frequency it will also depend upon maybe other parameters involving energy level e1 and e2 and i'm going to include those parameters in a constant i'm going to call that constant as capital b 1 2 so this constant basically represents the probability of absorption okay so here if i say okay b 1 2 this is the probability of absorption or stimulated absorption okay now of course it will also depend upon how many number of atoms are present in the ground state e1 versus how many number of atoms are present in the excited state e2 at a given point in time so let's suppose that i have n one number of atoms present in the ground state and n two number of atoms present in the excited state so for an absorption of a photon the rate will also depend upon n one so the rate at which the absorption of a photon of frequency nu takes place will depend upon the energy density it will depend upon the probability of this kind of a stimulated absorption and it will depend upon the number of atoms in the ground state fine perfect now let's look at the emission of a photon Now, as I already mentioned to you, the emission of a photon can take place via two mechanisms. One is a spontaneous emission, the other is a stimulated emission. So in the spontaneous emission, you will have some sort of a radiation which spontaneously decays in a very short interval from E2 to E1. Now the spontaneous emission does not require any kind of an incident radiation. The spontaneous emission happens spontaneously automatically therefore it does not depend upon the energy density of frequencies present so therefore for spontaneous emission the rate is only uh, proportional to the number of atoms present in the excited state and of course the probability of spontaneous emission which i'm going to call as a21 so a21 basically depends upon uh, it is, is a con it's a constant number that gives us an idea about uh, the various parameters that uh, depend upon whether or not uh, what is the probability that a transition from e2 to e1 is going to take place so you can think of a21 as the probability of spontaneous uh, emission So this is essentially the rate at which spontaneous emission is happening now what about stimulated emission now stimulated emission does depend upon the energy density because it requires an incident radiation right so the stimulated emission requires that there is an incident photon because of which the transition from the higher level to the lower level takes place and this process releases a photon 
in phase with the incident photon. So therefore, the stimulated emission does depend upon the energy density. So it will depend upon energy density. Let's suppose it also depends upon uh, the properties of the energy levels, which we are going to call as some kind of a constant B21, let's suppose, where B21 is the probability of stimulated emission. And of course, it depends upon the number of atoms in the energy level E2. So it depends upon N2. So therefore, the rate at which an emission of a photon takes place, so let's suppose I call this as capital N221, is equal to sum of this, right? So it is equal to N2 A21 plus N2 B21 U nu, all right? Now in thermal equilibrium, the rate at which the photon is absorbed is equal to the rate at which the photon is emitted because by definition of thermal equilibrium, the system is at constant temperature. So it is absorbing as much radiation as it is emitting that much radiation. So in that kind of a situation, both these two terms are going to be equal. So a thermal equilibrium. we have the rate of the transitions from 1 to 2 is equal to the rate of the transitions from 2 to 1. So if I plug this into the equation, so I have N1 B12 U nu is equal to, you have N2 and within brackets you have A21 plus B21 U new all right now what we can do is we can divide the entire equation by n2 and b21 so let's divide the entire equation by n2 and b21 so n1 upon n2 and here we will have b12 upon b21 u new is equal to divided by n2 so n2 n2 gets cancelled and divided by b21 so here i have a21 upon b21 plus b21 again gets cancelled you are left with u new so i can rearrange the terms here so if i bring this so if i bring this this side it simply ends up becoming u new becomes a constant and in the bracket we have n1 upon n2 b12 upon b21 minus 1 close bracket is equal to a21 upon b21 so let me rewrite this equation at the top here so then u nu does becomes if i make a comparison u nu therefore becomes so in the numerator we have a 21 upon b21 okay and then in the denominator i have n1 upon n2 times b12 upon b21 upon b21 minus 1 so this is the basically energy density as uh, predicted by the einstein's approach where we have included this kind of a phenomena of stimulated emission. Now we can actually calculate the number of atoms at any given energy level uh, based on the temperature of the system because uh, we can apply the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution function to get an idea about the number of atoms at energy level 1 and 2 because the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution function is a function that gives us an idea of the number of particles uh, in an ensemble or in an assembly having energy E. So this is basically equal to some constant, let's suppose I call it capital A or C, whatever you want to call it, E to the power minus 
epsilon upon kt where k is the Boltzmann constant and t is the temperature. So this is a distribution function that we can use to calculate the numbers n1 and n2. So I can say that n1 is equal to a e to the power minus e1 upon kt and you have n2 is equal to a e to the power minus e2 upon kt. So now I can find out what is n1 upon n2. So what is n1 upon n2? n1 upon n2 is a, a gets cancelled and then you are left with e to the power minus e1 minus e2 upon kt. Now what is e1 minus e2? e1 minus e2 is essentially equal to the uh, frequency nu uh, via the expression e1 minus e2 is equal to h nu. All right. So e1 minus e2 essentially is equal to h nu. So I can substitute h nu here to get this particular expression e to the power minus h nu upon kt. So if I substitute this here, okay, if I substitute this here, then I end up getting finally this particular expression that u which is the energy density is equal to a21 upon b21 is equal to b12 upon b21 times n1 upon n2 which is equal to e to the power minus h nu upon kt minus 1. So this is the energy density uh, as predicted by Einstein. Uh, wait a minute, uh, I just made a small mistake. Uh, so here E2 minus E1 is equal to H nu. So therefore this should be E1 minus E2 should be minus H nu. So minus minus becomes plus. So this should be a plus here. Okay. So E to the power H nu upon KT. So this is what we have obtained to be the energy density of a material or a black body or a cavity as predicted by Einstein. Now we can make a comparison of this with the theoretically successful expression of the Planck's energy density distribution. So if you make a comparison with the Planck's energy density distribution, then what do we find? If we make a comparison with the Planck distribution, then the Planck's distribution is simply u nu is equal to 8 pi h nu cube upon c cube times 1 upon e to the power h nu upon kt minus 1. So this is the distribution uh, given by Planck. So if we make a comparison of what we obtain using the Einstein's approach with that of the uh, theoretically successful Planck distribution, we can immediately say from here that, uh, let me rub the board first. So basically, this term B12 upon B21, if we make a comparison, is equal to 1. So that's why we have B12 is equal to B21. That means, B12 is the probability of uh, stimulated absorption and B21 is the probability of stimulated emission and their probabilities are exactly equal, number one. And number two, we have A21 upon B21 is equal to this particular expression, 8 pi h, which are constants, upon C cube, which is a constant, and then you have nu cube, h pi, 8 pi h upon C cube times nu cube. So if we know B21, which is the probability of stimulated uh, uh, emission, we can automatically find A21, which is a probability of spontaneous emission. So there are three distinct conclusions we can make from this Einstein's approach. Number one, the probability of stimulated emission B21 is non-zero. Okay, it is non-zero. That means this proves number one, that stimulated emission occurs from a theoretical perspective. And also the probability of stimulated emission is exactly equal to the probability of 
stimulated absorption. Next, the probability of spontaneous emission is directly proportional to nu cube or we can say the ratio of the probability of spontaneous emission upon stimulated emission is directly proportional to nu cube. So as the energy level difference increases, spontaneous emission is going to dominate over the stimulated emission. All right, because it is proportional to nu cube, as the energy level difference increases, spontaneous emission will dominate over the stimulated emission. And also, if we figure out any one of these probabilities, we can figure out the other probabilities based on these particular expressions. So this is the Einstein's approach using the Einstein coefficients to explain, uh, of course, come up with an uh, explanation for the Planck distribution for the energy density of a material and also give us an idea about uh, the various kinds of probabilities associated with stimulated absorption, spontaneous emission and stimulated emission. So that is all for today. I hope you have understood uh, the basics of the physics behind lasers and the concept of stimulated emission and how we can correlate that with black body radiation spectrum. So that is all for today. I'm Divya Joridas. Thank you so much. Uh, this is for the love of physics. I'll see you next time. Take care. Bye-bye.